Beauty brands are talking a lot more about sustainability and the environment. And it makes sense. Climate change is a huge problem and most of us don't want to make things worse. Well, maybe not him. But beauty marketing is full of false promises and meaningless buzzwords. What's actually better for the environment and what is feel-good fluff? Well, most of it is fluff. I'm Michelle, Chem PhD, cosmetic chemist and marketing connoisseur. I'm here with Jen, another cosmetic chemist and science communicator who specializes in sustainability. We're going to break down some of the most common myths that brands use to pretend they're greener than they are, so you can see through the marketing more easily and make informed decisions about what to buy. But it's not all doom and gloom, we will also go through things we can do to actually be more sustainable, so stick around till the end. Let's start with the idea that natural ingredients are better for the environment than synthetic ones when you finish using them and they drift off into the environment. This myth shows up a lot with sunscreens. Some places are banning chemical sunscreens because of the idea that they harm coral reefs. But this isn't based on good evidence, I've talked about it before. Instead, these places are promoting mineral sunscreens, mostly with zinc oxide based on this assumption that it is natural and therefore won't harm coral or any other wildlife. This is not true. When zinc oxide sunscreen gets washed off your body, it doesn't necessarily end up someplace that naturally has zinc oxide. And even if it does, it can raise the concentration there compared to before. And how harmful something is depends on how much there is. So extra zinc oxide can be a problem. There are actually a lot of studies showing that zinc oxide is toxic to coral and other aquatic organisms. For example, these data tables come from a 2022 National Academies report on the environmental impacts of sunscreen. Each of these rows is an example of a harmful effect that zinc oxide has been found to have. There's also this diagram that compares the toxicity of different chemical and physical sunscreen ingredients. Each black dot is an amount that caused a toxic effect in a study. The lower a dot is on this graph, the less you need of that ingredient to have the harmful effect. In other words, the more potently harmful it is. You can see that both zinc oxide and titanium dioxide, the other natural sunscreen, can start causing harm at lower concentrations than some unnatural chemical sunscreens. As the report says, these two categories of UV filters completely overlap with respect to acute toxicity. And this is still the case with non-nano zinc oxide. Nano refers to smaller particles that tend to be used in sunscreens because they protect against UV better and they look a bit less clown-like. In a lot of sunscreen marketing, you'll see this idea that if you use larger non-nano particles, it will be completely safe. But zinc oxide dissolves in water, which means larger particles, get smaller. Like and subscribe for more mind-blowing facts like these. Plus, those dissolved zinc ions can also be harmful. Zinc is a micronutrient that living organisms need, but it is also a heavy metal. It's toxic if there's too much. That's why if you look up the safety data sheet for zinc oxide, you'll see this symbol featuring a dead fish. It's surrounded by warnings about how it's very toxic to aquatic life. Zinc oxide, even when in non-nano form, has been recognized as potentially toxic for a really long time. Neither chemical nor physical sunscreens seem to be a big issue for coral reefs. Based on the relevant evidence so far, the amounts near reefs are too low to be having that much of an impact, especially in light of other stresses like rising temperatures. Research is still ongoing also for other aquatic organisms. But it's pretty clear that zinc oxide isn't a completely safe alternative. And this goes for pretty much any natural ingredient. Just because it's natural doesn't mean it's safe, which you hopefully already know because nature is always trying to kill us. Also, the zinc oxide and titanium dioxide in sunscreens isn't really natural most of the time, it's usually man-made. That's because if you just take them from nature, they're often contaminated with very natural, toxic heavy metals like lead. This is also the reason why natural iron oxides, which are the skin-colored pigments and foundation, aren't allowed in cosmetics in the US, they have to be synthetic. When we talk about the environmental impacts of different ingredients in our products, we usually focus on where the ingredients go after we finish using them. This is going to be a recurring theme. What we can see and control is usually what we think about. Where the product goes after we've used it, we can see it going down the drain, and what we do with the empty packaging. But this is only one part of environmental impact. There's also getting those ingredients in the first place. And a lot of people assume that natural ingredients are more environmentally friendly to produce than synthetic ones. Again, this is not true. And this production part is a really big factor when it comes to the overall environmental impact. The more holistic way of thinking about impact is to look at the whole life cycle of the product. This is the life cycle. Most of the time we focus on this part, which is disposal and recycling, also called end of life. But there's a lot that happens before the product actually gets to you and 
all of these have environmental impacts. The raw materials get processed and turned into ingredients, which then get turned into your product. The same steps happen to make the packaging. Your product then gets shipped a bunch of times. There's also a bunch of shipping in that first part. Then it ends up at your house. You use it, which is another big part of the impact, for example, with water use. And then there's the disposal and recycling. We've already talked about the disposal of ingredients and how natural isn't always better. But natural also isn't automatically better when it comes to production. When we hear natural, it kind of sounds like someone wanders through a forest and picks leaves off trees and mashes them to make your products while birds chirp and deer dance. It just sounds more sustainable. But that is pretty far from reality. There are lots of natural ingredients that have huge environmental costs to produce. For example, essential oils, it can take hundreds to thousands of kilograms of plant material to get a single kilogram of essential oil. And many essential oils are mostly sourced from plants growing in the wild, or at least the wild versions are more valuable. One example that Jen's talked about before is Indian sandalwood. Sandalwood is the most economically important tree globally. The value hinges on aromatic chemical composition, namely high sandalwood content. Sandalwood content is concentrated as trees get older. Harvesting generally happens when the trees are 30 years old. This, coupled with growing demand plus widespread fungal infection, has driven the species to endangerment. Adulteration, smuggling, and illicit trade remain major challenges. Another example is licorice extract, in skincare, it's usually wild harvested licorice that's used because it has a high concentration of the active components. Wild licorice has been uncontrollably overharvested to the point that there is now more licorice being sold in the market than there is being produced. Licorice helps soils with sand management and therefore overexploitation of wild licorice in the sandy regions it typically grows directly contributes to desertification. For both sandalwood and licorice, the obvious solution is to limit wild harvesting, which is harder than it sounds, and switch to farmed versions, which is a bit less natural and usually lower quality. There's been efforts to increase the quality of the farm versions, but that is also harder than it sounds. And even though in these cases farming is more sustainable than wild harvesting, it is still not great for the environment. Agriculture has a huge impact on the environment. According to the 2019 IPBES report, agricultural expansion into intact ecosystems was the greatest threat to biodiversity loss. Agriculture is also a significant contributor to greenhouse gas emissions. And we don't just farm cosmetic ingredients, the land and resources could have been used to produce food instead. Food security is a really big issue. Right now, we have an immense global challenge of figuring out how to feed our growing population with the limited resources we have while also reducing our impacts. From my perspective, it's hugely problematic to divert agri-space away from food towards production of things like cosmetics or aroma chemicals, especially if there's a less impactful way of production already available. And these less impactful ways of production can be natural or synthetic. Ultimately, it's complex and it depends. Many natural materials and cosmetics are byproducts of food, agriculture, or even biodiesel production, albeit this in itself is problematic for similar reasons. Some essential oils are produced via byproducts and could be considered as upcycled. For these, the continued use of natural materials makes sense. And a lot of the time, ingredients made from byproducts are also cheaper. This links to another really annoying marketing trope. A lot of clean, natural brands like to brag about how precious and rare their ingredients are, how many rose petals are in each bottle, how long it took to grow, and they shame other ingredients, which are usually synthetic, for being cheap. And then at the same time, they claim to be more sustainable. This makes zero sense. If more resources went into making a product, that is not more sustainable. Cheaper ingredients that are made from salvaged waste materials are usually a more sustainable option, even though there is this sort of snobbery against them. Turning waste into something useful and valuable is a good thing from an environmental perspective. And on this theme of making the most out of limited resources, here is the next myth. Organically farmed ingredients are more environmentally friendly than conventionally farmed ones. Most people think organic means more environmentally friendly because that is what organic farming organizations say that their goal is. It's in all four of their founding principles. 
But if you look at the actual rules that farmers need to follow to be certified organic, you'll see that they aren't actually based on scientific evidence. It's mostly just based on this idea of naturalness. In general, synthetic substances like pesticides and fertilizers are prohibited and non-synthetic substances are allowed. But like we've discussed, natural isn't necessarily better for the environment, and this applies to pesticides too. More and more studies have found that organic farming can actually end up with greater environmental impacts in a lot of areas. This 2017 meta-analysis compared a bunch of studies looking at the environmental impacts of conventional versus organic farming. They looked at producing 90 different foods. The higher a dot is on this graph, the worse organic farming is compared to conventional farming. First off, you can see that a lot of it depends on the type of food. The different colored dots represent different categories of food and they're at different heights. There is also a lot of variation for the specific farms in different countries. For a lot of the data sets, there's a really long line, which means that there is a huge range involved. So it isn't like organic is always better or conventional is always better, but there are some categories of environmental impact where organic is generally worse. And since then, there's been more analyses where scientists have started taking land use into account when looking at the greenhouse gas impact, which this analysis didn't do. Organic farming tends to be less efficient. More land is needed to produce the same amount of a crop. And if you're using that land for farming, you will generally need to clear trees. Having less trees means that you have less carbon dioxide being absorbed. So there is essentially going to be an opportunity cost. And if you factor that greater land use in, it turns out that organic farming usually produces a lot more greenhouse gases. One analysis found that in Sweden, organic peas would have a 50% greater greenhouse gas impact than conventionally farmed peas. For winter wheat, the difference was 70%. In order to meet our growing demand, in light of the environmental limitations and impacts associated with agriculture, we need to figure out how to produce more ingredients with the same or even less impact. Despite that there's a market push to tell us that organic is sustainable, there are some serious limitations of organic agriculture, especially pertaining to its efficiency. This isn't to say that organic agriculture is unsustainable, full stop. In some regions, it may make sense. In the same way that in other regions, conventional agriculture or even genetic engineering may be the better option. Ultimately, there are no panaceas when it comes to sustainability in agriculture. Whether organic or conventional methods are better changes a lot depending on the context and what impact you're looking at. Not even just with the specific crops and environmental impacts, but also things like pesticide exposure for farmers and consumer prices. Even if we look at biodiversity, which is one of the more widely accepted advantages of organic farming, it turns out that if you take that extra land use into account, on average, it breaks even. The obvious solution would be to use whatever methods have lower environmental impacts in a particular situation, whether they're organic or not. But organic doesn't allow that. It just limits the options that farmers have based on this misconception that natural is better. In some situations, like for cereal crops and bird biodiversity, it's better to produce the same amount of food in a smaller area using conventional farming and leave a strip of unfarmed land than it is to use a larger area for organic farming. But that would not be allowed under organic rules. And there are more examples now of more environmentally sustainable farming practices that kind of just ignore organic. And we haven't actually dealt with that mold thing yet. Natural products tend to have shorter shelf lives and go off faster than products with more synthetic components. A lot of synthetic ingredients were originally designed as improvements on naturally occurring chemicals. It isn't always the case, but there is a reason why no one is that surprised when natural products have texture or color changes or start growing mold. And if you have to throw out half the product, that means that the stuff that you use with that waste taken into account will be a lot more resource intensive to produce. Speaking of natural things decomposing, our next myth, making synthetic ingredients from petrochemicals is worse for the environment. There's this idea that synthetic ingredients made from petroleum are bad for the environment because petroleum is a fossil fuel. Yes, fossil fuels are bad for the environment. Extracting petroleum through processes like fracking can be really destructive. And there's also all the carbon dioxide that gets released when they're burned as a fuel to release energy, which is the main driver of climate change. But there are some big differences between petroleum as a fuel and ingredients that are made from petroleum. There is no petroleum sourcing with the intent of making cosmetic ingredients. The petrochemicals that are used are all waste products from the petroleum sector. Societally, we want to move away from our reliance of fossil fuels, but until the world does, and while the world is fueled by them, the byproducts that the cosmetics use 
will be there. In the future, this may not be the case, but this is the current reality. And making natural ingredients also uses up fossil fuels. Tilling, making fertilizer and pesticides, moving water for irrigation, harvesting, transporting plant materials, processing, purification, all of this uses energy which usually comes from fossil fuels. And this time the fossil fuels are purposely dug up and burned as fuels to get out energy. And that burning is the part that releases carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. If petroleum jelly isn't burnt, then that carbon stays sequestered in the petroleum jelly and it won't directly contribute to climate change. Again, it depends on the specific situation. Synthetic isn't always less impactful than natural. Making synthetic ingredients, processing and purifying them also uses energy. And again, this mostly comes from burning fossil fuels. And again, some natural ingredients are also made from waste materials from other processes, which means energy savings and less carbon dioxide. So it all comes back to looking at the data for each individual ingredient, which means life cycle analyses. A few examples. An LCA from Simrise, where they show that their synthetically produced menthol produced 8 kilograms of CO2 per kilogram menthol versus 50 to 100 for its natural counterpart. In contrast, we can look to Genomatica's bronchide butylene glycol, where they halved their CO2 emissions with the use of plant-based starting points via biotechnology instead of the traditional production from fossil fuels. Then again, since they use a genetically modified biocatalyst in this process, many consumers and eco-certifiers still view this as unsustainable. There is no blanket rule about natural always being more sustainable. When we're considering whether or not natural materials are more or less impactful, we should be asking ourselves, are we using prime agricultural land to produce them or are they coming from waste or byproducts from crops that we're already using anyway in other sectors? This also means there's no blanket rule about what benefits the fossil fuel industry more, buying synthetic ingredients made from petrochemicals versus buying natural ingredients that use a lot of fossil fuels to produce. And speaking of myths about petrochemicals, we need to talk about packaging. The idea that plastic is always worse for the environment than other types of packaging is everywhere, not just in cosmetics. And it is, again, a massive oversimplification. Like I mentioned before, a lot of this is because we tend to focus on just that end of life part when we choose products, because we have to personally deal with it. Does the bottle go into the bin or can it be reused or recycled? Does it degrade? And just like before, end of life is just one part of environmental impact. If we stopped using all plastic and use more eco-friendly alternatives instead, like glass, paper and aluminum, we would need on average 3.6 times the material, 2.2 times the energy, and there would be an average increase of about 2.7 times the carbon dioxide emissions. This makes a lot of sense if we look at each part of the life cycle. Plastic isn't universally the worst option for any part. For example, with production, plastic is produced via byproducts of the petroleum sector. Contrast that to paper, where there's a lot of processing from wood and then glass and aluminum. They can come from recycled sources, but there is a lot of heat involved that increases the impact. One of the things we need to remember is why plastic packaging became so widespread in the first place. It is really good at protecting the stuff inside it. To transportation, for example, with glass versus plastic, Plastic is lightweight for its strength and therefore the transportation CO2 emissions tend to be less. There's also the matter of glass breakage. And similar for aluminum, aluminum is heavier, it dents easily, and people don't want to buy it then. Even for end of life, monomaterial plastic can be recycled about 40 times and some companies to strive for eco options are switching to partly paper packaging, which ends up needing a plastic layer since paper doesn't stand up to, for example, water. And then as a result, they end up using multi-layered materials that are harder to recycle and ends up being worse. Ultimately here, the best packaging option in terms of the environmental impact is a case by case basis with the best option varying greatly from individual formulations and users. For example, what are the user's habits? What kind of recycling infrastructure do they have available? Is your bottle return program something that they can viably access? Blanket statements that plastic equals bad are both, from my perspective, unhelpful and potentially harmful. At the end of the day, 
There is no silver bullet for sustainable packaging and every option has its pros and cons. So hopefully from all of this, it's clear that sustainability is complicated and straightforward blanket rules just don't work. We can't just always choose natural or organic products or choose glass over plastic and expect that we are making the better choice. So what can we actually do to be more sustainable? I think the most obvious thing to do is to just consume less. Buying something is almost always going to be less sustainable than not buying something, regardless of whether it's eco-friendly. Per capita, consumerism is the most environmentally destructive thing we do societally. The overwhelming evidence shows that the negative impacts associated with overconsumption vastly outweigh any of the positives associated with green innovation. So it's important to consider if you really need to buy something because a lot of companies make it seem like you're saving the planet just by buying their product, when in reality, it is probably going to have a net negative impact. And this is filtering into regulation. For example, in the UK, they've already said that labels like green, sustainable, and eco-friendly could be considered deceptive, unless a business can prove that, as a whole, there is a positive environmental impact to using the product, which is pretty unlikely. There's a push towards green consumerism, which is ultimately at odds with sustainability as it paradoxically increases consumption, which increases impact. Also, there is a market incentivization for green. Consumers are willing to pay more for products they perceive to be green, and there is also a rapidly growing market for impact or ESG investment, where investors want to invest in companies they, again, perceive to be socially or ecologically superior. Given how complicated and context-dependent sustainability is, I think it is also really important to ask questions. If a brand says that their product is sustainable, ask them for evidence. Because there's so much complexity, we can't work out what's going on without brands providing some level of transparency. We don't know how the butylene glycol in their product was made. We don't know whether their production plant uses renewable energy. Companies pursuing sustainable development must have access to as much relevant information as they can in order to make the best possible decision. To get this information, they must measure and record data in terms of their specific goals. Environmental accounting is the backbone of sustainable development. Because you can't be accountable unless you're actually accounting for things. Life cycle assessments can be seen as the most important tool for understanding a product's impact. For example, actually calculating specific environmental impacts of every single ingredient and how much is going into the product or how things are being transported, etc. A lot of the time, the clean movement just bases their ideologies on assumptions, like assuming that natural is always safer. If we want to move to reduce our impacts, we need substantiation, and we need the specific measures to be relevant and standardized, so you can actually make comparisons between companies. Most of the current popular eco standards, certifiers, and labels you see around don't do this very well. And as a consequence, they may actually be resulting in more greenwashing rather than true sustainability progress, despite how they're positioning themselves. It's also important as consumers to be informed about what things are actually more sustainable. The beauty industry responds to consumer demand. If we push for the wrong thing, like non-evidence-based eco-certifications or less plastic or more natural ingredients, regardless of what the environmental impacts actually are, brands are going to deliver it. So we could be contributing to making everything worse. Like we saw with Clean Beauty, people pushing for paraben-free products meant that brands started using less effective and more irritating allergenic preservatives. That led to more skin reactions, maybe an allergy epidemic and products that go off faster. So it's important not to go for easy answers and make sure you're sharing the correct information. And if you see people and brands spreading myths, it's important to counteract that and tell people where they can find better information. A problem we're increasingly seeing is misplaced conservation, where misinformation and polarization can actually work together against sustainable development. For example, by leading to a misallocation of resources into efforts that fundamentally don't make sense, sometimes making the issues that they're trying to address worse. A second way sustainability misinformation is working against sustainable development is via green nudging. When ineffective, but perhaps easier, policy comes before the effective, but harder policy, the effective policy is less likely to be successful. If the effective policy comes first, the chances of success are much greater. One example here could be carbon pricing, well supported by the scientific evidence to be an effective strategy for climate change mitigation. Having policy that focuses 
focuses on things like carbon footprinting, which is widely debated as an effective strategy, come before, as we're currently doing, when we finally get to the carbon pricing, it's going to be an increasingly uphill battle. The order of policy in environmental action in general matters. Therefore, relying on the best available evidence is crucially important as we pursue sustainable development. One final thing I want to add is that if we want to make significant strides towards sustainability, what we really need are science-based policy changes. Consumer scapegoating and corporate sustainability aren't working. We've seen this with carbon pricing, which, as mentioned, is one of the more well-supported policies for addressing climate change. But instead of focusing on implementing it effectively, there's a lot of blame on consumers and a lot of focus on things like carbon footprinting, which has incentivized a pretty problematic market for carbon offsets, which is yet another whole complex topic I won't get into here. Sustainability is obviously a huge topic, so we only covered a tiny fraction of it here. Let us know what other questions about sustainability you have. If you want to find out more about these topics, I've linked some of Jen's posts and podcasts, which are amazing. Definitely check those out. We've also started Beauty Psycom, which will hopefully spread more accurate beauty science information. Check us out as well.